A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, it is a um, great and terrible privilege to be the preacher on Sunday morning. Um, To be the one who gets to stand up here and to tell you the truth about my life. And hope that uh, you find some truth in that about yours as well. Today, I will take full advantage of that privilege and share with you a confession of, well, I'll tell you, exactly what I do when I receive a phone call from a telemarketer. So after I have fallen for their trap by picking up the phone and saying, hello, this is Taylor, which is exactly how I've said it. Uh, If you've ever called me, that's exactly how it, hello, this is Taylor. Then they begin their spiel, and about three words into it, I realize what's going on. You hear that little click. They pick up the phone, and they begin to talk, and I, I don't even wait for them to finish the sentence. I don't, they're just a few words in, and I interrupt them, and I uh, jump right in the middle of their sentence, and I say, oh, thank you, not for me, bye, click, the end. I don't even, I don't play around. I don't wait for them to say bye. I don't engage them in conversation. I just, done. Thank you, not for me, bye. Why am I confessing this today? Because that's what I want to say to Jesus today. Just as he gets started on this whole business about loving my enemies, and I just want to cut him off and say, oh, that's really not for me. Thank you, bye. Don't you think that That's what the disciples thought when he got to this point of the sermon. Like, oh, okay, I've had enough. How do I slip out of here without him noticing I've left? Who wants to listen to all of this? Who wants to deal with this tough stuff? Yesterday I was driving home from being out of town for part of spring break, and a guy in a van in front of me literally threw out of the window the remnants of a sandwich and the foil wrapping that it came in. And he threw it in a way that really, really looked like he was intentionally trying to get it to hit my car behind him. And, um, of course, I I dodged it because I have skills in driving. (laughs) And then I could see as we pulled up and stopped at the next light and they were still in front of me, I could see he and his buddy looking back at me and laughing. And I thought, seriously? Seriously? I have to love these people? I have to preach on this tomorrow. And that's just a petty little annoyance, right? Jesus is talking about real enemies. People who have really hurt you or taken something from you. People who endanger your life or at least go out of their their way to make you miserable. Stephen Eason writes on this passage and he says, we want to be Christians at potluck dinners. We love being Christians at infant baptisms and weddings. We really enjoy being Christians at Christmas. 
We even like being Christians at a funeral. But this is not Christianity, is it? It's way too extreme. We do not want to be Christians when it's time to turn a cheek or give away the cloak, go the second mile or give to a beggar or loan everything that we have to anybody who wants it. The truth is that this is really not the religion that we asked for. We asked for something nice enough, but not radical. We wanted something respectable, religion that that does really make us better people, but nothing too weird or extreme, none of this Jesus freak stuff. As we discussed the book, The, The Cost of Discipleship, this week, this is our Lenten book study. And in my small group, we found that um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the author, his bar for discipleship was just, it felt too high for us. Totally unattainable. We wanted to know if there was like an option that was a level or two below that, that might be better suited, we might be better suited for. We could settle for that rather than discipleship. And yet Jesus calls again. Be perfect. As your heavenly father is perfect. He begins with what's called the lex talionis. The law of retaliation. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You might be surprised to learn as I was. That um, this is actually a law that's meant to limit retaliation. Not to promote it. It was meant to establish a law of proportionate justice rather than allowing for private revenge to escalate things to one of my teeth for ten of yours, right? It was a a power equalizer. By the time Jesus gives this sermon hundreds of years after the law is given, it was commonplace for those injuries to be compensated with money rather than with eyes or with teeth. So the law... The law allowed for compensation that was equal to the injury or the crime. Jesus, on the other hand, does not. At first, it sounds like Jesus is inviting us to be the doormats of the world. But I think that he's up to something else here. He gives three examples of how God's people are to live differently. How to not resist an evildoer as he commands. First, he says, turn the other cheek. Culturally, in Jesus' time and place, the slap in the face he describes would not have been an attack. It's not a a violent thing. It's an insult. And Jesus suggests that by giving them uh, the other cheek, that that's a move that doesn't return violence, but it also doesn't make a doormat out of the cheek turner. It just changes the game. And then, giving both the inner coat and the outer cloak. That inner coat was sometimes, um, it was demanded as a repayment of a debt. But there were laws against taking both the coat and the cloak. So to voluntarily give both was to voluntarily give give up the right to enforce that limit. For the one with less power to step outside of the power structure of rights, what they have a right to, and to step instead into a mode of self-giving. It changes the game. Finally, going two miles instead of one. This refers to a common practice in which the Roman military would um, lawfully force civilians to transport their military gear and equipment. So legally, one mile was the limit that they could force you to go. They could require that. But that limit was, of course, regularly violated. Officers would force people to travel longer distances just because they could. It, was a, a, it reminded everybody who was in power. Jesus suggests that His followers volunteer the second mile. That they not go that second mile at the demand of the officer, but to go at their own volition to change the game. What Jesus is doing here is inviting his followers to a different kind of resistance to evil. One that's more radical than violence, but it's more creative 
than submission. Jesus, he invites his followers not to defy the enemies themselves, because doing that would would play into the very adversarial nature of their relationship. It, It starts a fight. Instead, he invites us to defy the cycle of making enemies, to undo the adversarial relationship. He invites us to change the game, to resist the paradigm of of hate and brutality that is behind the evil act, and to do that all while loving the evildoer. Scholar Matthew Bolton puts it this way, He says that Jesus says, do not fight fire with fire, rather fight fire with water, and thereby refuse to take part in the incendiary, all too familiar work of injury and domination. Here's how I put it. What Jesus is doing here is helping us relocate exactly what we are against. Whether we are victimized or scandalized or just simply fed up, Jesus reminds us that it's not the haters and the perpetrators that we're up against. Instead, it's the evil that is expressed as violence or as prejudice or as injustice or as greed. Jesus won't allow us to descend into hating our neighbor or perpetuating the cycle of hatred or violence even though it would be much easier and it might feel better in in the short term. The person always makes the easy target, don't they? But Jesus reminds us that that person is always, always, always our neighbor, the one that we are commanded to love. That commandment haunts us because it, it has no loopholes. It has no clause to nullify it. It doesn't say, love your neighbor, except in such cases when she is acting ridiculous. Or love your neighbor as long as your neighbor is not you. It's simply love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus invites us to change the game, to refuse to focus our anger and our indignation onto a person And to channel it instead into a creative undoing of violence and hatred. Do not hate your enemy. Do not resist evildoers. Rather, pull the rug out from under evil. Deflate the power of violence. I know that it seems impossible. Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., those who followed them, they showed us what it, what it looks like on a grand scale. I want to try to show you what it looks like up close. Three years ago, a photographer for the New York Times traveled to southern Rwanda on an assignment. And I want to show you a few of the pictures you'll see that he took. The people that you see are a part of a national movement for reconciliation following the genocide that occurred over 20 years ago. In each pair, there is a perpetrator and a survivor. So one who has harmed and one who has been harmed. Houses were burned. Family members were brutally killed. Unspeakable crimes were committed. And yet in each pair, there has been a movement toward forgiveness. Following training and a willingness to confess to the crimes that they've committed, the the perpetrators sought and they received forgiveness, a pardon for what they've done. This picture has Francois and Epiphany in it. I want you to listen to what Francois says. He, He killed the son of Epiphany. And he says, Because of the genocide perpetrated in 1994, I participated in the killing of the son of this woman. We are now members of the same group of unity and reconciliation. We share in everything. If she needs some water to drink, I fetch some for her. There's no suspicion between us, whether under sunlight or during the night. I used to have nightmares recalling the sad events I've been through, but now I can sleep peacefully. And when we are together, we are like brother and sister. No suspicion between us. And incredibly, Epiphany, she tells the same story. She says, before, when I had not yet granted him pardon, he could not come close to me. 
I treated him like my enemy. But now I would rather treat him like my own child. Another perpetrator in this project said this. He said, she could not have known I was involved in the killings of her children. But I told her what happened. When she granted me pardon, all the things in my heart that had made her look at me like a wicked man faded away. All the things in my heart that had made her look at me like a wicked man faded away. It seems about as impossible as Jesus' command to be perfect. The truth is, such perfect love, y'all, it's far outside of what we can offer on our own. This perfect love can flow only from God, but when it flows through us, It upends all that is broken in this world. There once was evil, we begin to see healing. Story after story. All over the world, right here, maybe even in your own home. Story after story, God shows us what grace can do. It peels away the layers of evil and of anger and of violence, leaving only beloved, imperfect, and yet perfect children of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.